Good morning. Welcome to Experiencing a New Beginning. Whether you are here in person or you are joining us online, we are two churches who have come together because we truly believe that we're greater together than we are apart. And so we want you to feel free to worship God as we enter into our service today. Just focus and concentrate on the Lord and allow him to be able to comfort you, to keep you, and to use you for his glory. This morning, I'm going to ask that you take the time to go to your Bible, if you would stand with me, 1 Peter chapter number 4. 1 Peter chapter number 4, we're going to be reading verse number 12, verse number 12. If you don't have a Bible, we do have it on our screen behind me. 1 Peter chapter number 4, verse number 12. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. And my Bible says, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through as if something strange were happening to you. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. We'll now have our choir, and we ask that you sing along with them as we sing glory to God. How many of you need strength this morning? How many of you need strength? How many of you need hope? Well, we have the perfect song for you this morning. You are my strength. Yes. Oh. We want you to sing along with us. We'll sing it the first time. You'll catch on. How many of you already know this one? time to worship. It's time to worship. It's time to acknowledge who God is.
Reaches to me. Reaches to me. Reaches to me. Strength yes. like no other Thank you, God. reaches to me. Hi. When you feel like you yes. don't have enough strength, rely on God's strength. Yes. Yes. All right, our next selection is I Give Myself Away. What are we giving ourselves to? Think about it. Listen to these words and, and just meditate on it. This is personal. It's personal. It's between you and God. Give myself away. I give myself away so you can use me. I give myself away. I give myself away so you.
Thank you, Lord. As we continue to let the music play, I'm going to ask Shelly if she would come up this morning and lead us to into a word of prayer. Father, we thank you. Thank you. We rejoice in this day that you've given us. Yes. You've made it for us, and we are thankful to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to celebrate our unity, our Thank experiencing you. new beginnings, as well as our diversity. Father, we, we thank you for being able to put our trust in you that while things seem Thank out you. of control in this world and it's so many distractions and we have problems and circumstances that weigh us down, God, but you are greater than all of that. Thank you. And we pray, Lord, that for this moment, for this time, this morning, that you will help us to put aside those distractions, those problems, and to focus on you and your word the message that you have for us this morning, Lord God. We know, we know that Jesus, when he talked to his disciples before he went to the cross, he said, in this world, you will have trouble, oh, yes, but yes. I've overcome the world. And if we're going to share in your glory, Lord God, we're going to share in your sufferings. And we know that there's people here today suffering, and we ask that you will comfort them and be with them. But for right now, help us to keep our eyes on you. On Jesus, we thank you for our Savior, Jesus, who has overcome the world. May we please bless Pastor Matt's message um, as we give you our hearts. Thank you that you are our strength and our hope alone. And we ask this all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And I so you can use me. I give myself away. Hope that you enjoyed our songs for praise and worship this morning. Give yourself away. Give yourself to Jesus so he can use you. At this time, we're going to have Sister Lene Hatfield come, and she's going to bring our announcements then she'll be immediately followed by Pastor Matt Silver with our message for today. Uh, children's Church, uh, we're going to have children. If you are a part of the Children's Church, if you would go ahead and join Pastor Craig in the back so that you can go to your area of service. Amen. All right, good morning. good morning. Here are our announcements for August 21st, 2022. First of all, our Connect cards. If you are new here, have a change of contact information, or you have a prayer request, we want to connect with you. So please take some time to fill out a Connect card. They're right there on that back table, and then place it in the collection boxes near the exit door so that we can stay connected with you. Science Sunday, invite every kid you know, yeah, ooh, ages 3 to 12 to come out on September 18th from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. for Science Sunday. There are going to be tons of fun experiments as we explore how God created everything and how those things work together to show how incredible God's creation is and how he controls all of it. Everything is free and it's going to be a blast. Although regis registering in advance is not necessary, we will have a drawing for those pre-registering for a fun prize awarded during the event. Amen. Lots of reasons to come on September 18th. And our Pendel Youth Conference, we have an exciting conference opportunity coming up for our middle school and high school students October 8th through the 10th in the 
All right, I'm trying to read this correctly. Kalahari Resort. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> this conference is a great way to get closer to God, and other students and students are encouraged to attend. For more information, stop by the table in the rear and connect with Pastor Craig. And another conference, we have our NAB Women's Conference. Ladies, consider attending the NAB Women's Conference at Harvey Cedars Bible Conference taking place October 21st through October 23rd. Women that attend will be inspired, encouraged, and refreshed. Amen. You will make great and lasting connections with one another. Amen. I've been before, so I can testify to that. It's a great time. And our very own sister, Kimberly Brown, will be a keynote speaker. So come on out, be encouraged, and let's encourage our sister. Amen. You don't want to miss it. Please see Sister Diane Maloney for more information and registration details. And finally, we know that God loves a cheerful giver and that giving is a part of our worship. If you would like to partner in our mission of helping people experience a new beginning with God and church, there are three ways that you can do so listed right here on the screen. You can, give, you can place your gift in the back in one of the boxes. You can text to give, or you can go to the website or app listed right here on the screen. Thank you so much, and that concludes our announcements. All right, well, good morning. good morning. Why does anybody sit in the front? Like, what's going on here? <laughs> I can't, the, the lights are aimed here, so I can't go in front. But I love to be like right there, but all right, I'm stuck. <laughs> is it us? I think it's us. It's us. I guess it is. I'm sorry. Pat? <laughs> so it's good to see everybody. Thank you for being here. I just want to say it's so good to sing of our need to Jesus, right? Because there has been a lot going on in the weeks. We know that some weeks you are here and you're just so excited for all that God's doing in your life. And sometimes you drag yourself here because of the heaviness, right? You're just like, I need to be filled up. I need to be encouraged. So thank you for being here today. Both ways, we've had some big prayers answered this week. Jim, I know you said just thank you for all the prayers that went out. We've had families prayed for. We had homecomings and happenings. So just know that this is a family that cares. And so share what's on your heart. And we want to meet you there. Well, uh, to the message now, I got an oh, easy question maybe. Do you find it easy or hard to do the right thing? It's church, people. What are you supposed to say? You're supposed to say, it is so easy to do the right thing. I love doing the right thing. The right thing's great, right? I appreciate your integrity walking in here because it's hard to do the right thing sometimes, right? Let me take you back to elementary school. You remember when it, it, you realized how hard it was to do the right thing in elementary school because if you listened to your parents, if you paid attention in school, if you turned your homework in, you got a nickname, and what was it? Teacher's pet. That's a good one. How about this one? Goody, goody, two shoes. Oh, now I never was called that. Um, I was never called Goody Goody Two Shoes. I don't know why, but I was thinking about a couple people that were in my class. You know, they just gave that extra. They did the things I want my very kids to do, but they were made fun of because maybe they cared a little too much. I was like, I wonder who else I knew that. I was like, oh, my wife, Carrie. Carrie, were you called that? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I married a Goody Goody Two Shoes. So I don't know what that says about her, but Goody Goody Two Shoes, I think is a good thing. I didn't know where that came from. Do you know where it came from? Goody, goody, two shoes or goody little two shoes? I didn't know. I looked it up. In 1765, John Newberry in London wrote a story called The History of Little Goody Two Shoes. And it was a fable much like Cinderella. The fable tells this poor orphan, orphan girl named Marjorie Meanwell. She goes through life with only one shoe. So a rich man buys her and presents her with a pair of shoes. And she ran around saying, I've got two shoes. I've got two shoes. Later, Marjorie becomes a teacher who marries a rich widower. And here was the part that I thought was interesting. The, the, the line here at the end was, the earning of wealth serves as proof that her virtue has been rewarded, a popular theme in children's literature of that era. Is virtue always rewarded? No. You know, like, don't you wish that fairy tale was true? Like, just hang on, keep doing the right thing, and somebody will die and you can marry him. <laughs> right? <laughs> Virtue's not always rewarded. 
I can remember being sat down when I was 22 by two friends, and they had a lot to get off their chest. I could tell they came over my home. I walked in the door, and they said, we got to talk to you. I'm like, okay. And they said, you're just not fun anymore. And I was like, hmm, continue. (laughs) It's not kind of what I was expected. I was a retail store manager. I was working a lot. I was advancing in the company. I was uh, serving with students at the church I grew up with. I was like, I think I'm doing the right thing right now. I know I don't give you guys as much time as I was, but they're like, no, 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 you're just not fun anymore. You don't go out and do, and they weren't saying go to church. I'll just say that. They, they were listing a few things I wasn't willing to do with them. And I realized like we were on a different path. And it's not that I was perfect. I wasn't perfect, but I was making an attempt to do the right things. And the people that I cared about so much, they weren't cheering me on. They weren't saying, hey, tell us about the good things you have going on in your life. They were disappointed because I wasn't with them right now. And if you've made a decision to start trying to do the right things or to follow Jesus, it's kind of surprising that people aren't cheering you on, right? Or saying, good job. Wow, I really appreciate the character you're developing. That doesn't always happen. My story is not unique. You've had that happen. I chose to give a story that was 20 years ago, but it can happen any week, right? Any given moment. What happens at work? You make a commitment to get there early. You do your job the best of your abilities. You talk to your coworkers. You listen to your boss. And you get a nickname there too, right? Kiss-up's the nice one, I'll say, right? There's plenty of other ones, but kiss-up is one of those names you can get. Let's say you decide to read your Bible on lunch break. You decide to pray for somebody, and you get a nickname there too. Maybe you're the preacher or church boy or church girl. You get a nickname at work. That's not so much fun. And, you know, we think that maybe people will applaud us for doing these good behaviors, but really, it's not. And so it's important to recognize, like, you can't understand if you're doing the right thing by looking around and seeing if people are applauding for you, right? It's kind of counterintuitive. You think, like, how do I know if I'm doing the right things in life? And you won't figure that out by looking to your left and right, looking behind you to see how many people are following you, who's cheering you on, because it's interesting. The more you focus on doing the right thing, you might actually find more tension in your relationships. Pleasing God may not win you friends and make you famous, right? Living the right way can be complicated. The right way, as I'm defining it, is living a life that's called righteous in God's mind. Right Right living. Living the way you were intended. Living with purpose. Doing things to the best of your creative ability. Being empowered by God to do it. And it's not always the popular way to live your life. But Jesus calls it a blessed life. We're looking at the Sermon on the Mount And uh, Jesus is telling this sermon to a crowd that had been gathering. And this crowd wasn't a super spiritual elite crowd. They were people that followed him because they were interested in him. They saw he was so much different than he was. But rather than being repulsed by his goodness, they were attracted by it because it was so sincere. He taught with authority. He talked with authority. He had the answers to life. Some people that gathered around were healed. Some people wanted to have family members healed, so they just brought them along to listen to Jesus. And Jesus has this big crowd around him. He's like, sit down, let me teach you a few things. And they sit down on the mountainside, and he starts opening up with some weird things that we think are convinced lead to a good life. In verse 3, he says, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. He starts off right away as, you might think you're here because you're so good or because you're really trying to impress God, but let me tell you what. When you recognize you don't have it all together, when you recognize that you're just a little poor and you need God in your life, that's when you're at the, that's when you're willing to get God work in your life, right? I don't have it all together. I'm just a little poor God. I need your help. Then he says, God blesses those who are mourned for they'll be comforted. Jesus basically says right away, life's not always easy. You're going to have some hardships. So when you have hardships, don't try to numb out. Don't try to pretend they don't exist. But go to me because I am the God of comfort. Don't pretend life's all good. Life can be hard. And I'm here to give you comfort. Then he says, God blesses those who are humble, for they'll inherit the whole earth. That's upside down, right? We want to get ahead. We show how much better we are than our peers. That way we get a promotion or we get the spotlight or we get followers. But no, Jesus says, no, no, no. Just because you're at a great place, be humble. And don't focus on dominating down. Lift others up. Have humility. Don't think too high of yourself, but also don't think too low of yourself. Don't think, woe is me all the time. Just live humbly. Live beautifully. Next is God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they'll be satisfied. Sometimes we look at, well, I'm good, so it's all good. But we say, 
How are other people doing? Is there injustice going on? And so I have a concern for those around me, their well-being as well. And God says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they'll be satisfied. Then he says, God blesses those who are merciful, for they'll be shown mercy. There's something about understanding that we need God's mercy that helps us extend it to other people. When someone messes up against me, I can realize, like, dude, we are all messed up. You just happen to, you just happen to mess me up. I, I forgive you, right? We extend that because God's forgiven us. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God purely. Pure emotions, doing the right things with the right heart. Not just doing the right things because it gets us ahead, but doing the right things with the right heart. We'll see God that way. And God blesses those who work for peace, for they'll be called children of God. Not peacekeepers. People are like, it's okay. It's all right. Let's not rock the boat. No, peacemakers. Taking people divided and stepping in and saying, come together. And so Jesus says all these things, right? First one is, blessed are the poor in spirit. You recognize, God, I can't do this list without your empowerment, right? But look at the last one. This is the book in. This closes the sermon series this week. And he says, God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right. You do these things right, people aren't loving you. People are going to make fun of you and despise you and call you names. And it's not always the best way of being treated. He says, God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. This last beatitude says, some people are going to have a problem when you live this way. The test of your faithfulness of God is not measured by your approval rating. It's not rated by your popularity. It's not rated by your safety. It's not measured by your bank account. Some of these measures we turn to for excess or reassurance aren't good indicators. Because to say it clearly, a comfortable life does not equal a right life. Sometimes we think, we're good. We're comfortable. I'm doing the right things. That does not mean that's what it is. The opposite's not always true, but just because life's good and you have everything does not mean you have the right things in focus. It's a hard message. It can be confusing, right? The comforts in this life do not confirm that we are living the right way. Jesus says God blesses those who are persecuted for doing the right thing. Jesus is cure. Persecution can happen for doing the right things. This verse is saying blessed or fortunate are those who suffer physically and or emotionally for doing the right things. I don't know how many of you have seen like when you started doing life God's way or doing the right things, it did not get easier. And you could probably have testimony after testimony, right? It could be financially. I've heard people say, I started giving to God, and then my car blew up. I'm like, yeah, that happens. (laughs) But I said, if I I gave, it would be given so much more in return. Whoever told you that? (laughs) Didn't really understand. So you might say, I heard this teaching, and I started looking at my job differently because my job, the whole premise of my job is actually not doing the right thing. It's taking advantage of people. The premise of what I'm selling is not actually ethical. Mm. How we're treating our customers isn't right. And so you might find yourself leaving a job and causing financial stress because you just know there's something wrong about where you're at. You might have to step up about unethical behavior at work. And then all of a sudden, you have a meeting in your office. You can't talk to coworkers that way. You're like, well, do you know what they just said to this person? You're concerned. Might affect you socially. I know folks that have made a decision to follow Jesus. And their family's not appro- approving that. Yeah. They're, de- they're accepting of Jesus as a rejection of them in their mind. And that's hard. It's hard to see. Physically, people are killed because they start believing in Jesus. There are more martyrs today than any time in history. That's hard to believe because we don't see it here. But it doesn't mean it's not true. So persecution comes in so many different forms. But Jesus makes it clear, when you become a Christian, persecution may come visit you. However, let me be clear, we should not go out to look to be persecuted. Yeah. Jesus isn't saying, he's not making a model out of persecution. Hey, if you're persecuted, that means you're doing the right thing too. That means this is also true. A persecuted life does not equal the right life. You can be persecuted for all kinds of things. Let me tell you how hard it's been walking around with this mustache for two weeks. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Pat, you know. Pat got to hear. Some people are making fun of me for it. You're glad I brought it up, right? Jesus isn't like, oh, Matt, you're so blessed because people are making fun of your mustache. Jesus might say, shave the thing off. It's distracting. (laughs) I don't know. 
But we can be... Uh, Let's talk about Pastor Anthony's mustache. You like his? I do. <laughs> Nobody giving you a hard time today. <laughs> we sometimes get it wrong. We think, well, I'm making a stand for this political party, or I'm making a stand for this political issue, or I'm making a stand for this issue. And you're making a stand, which is okay, you know, and it might be grounded in some things. And you might wonder, like, is this a right thing to say? And it depends on how you're stating it, right? Because we have to have dialogue. We have to have intentionality. But I know this. How's the fruit test? The fruit test is, is your persecution because of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? Because if you're calling people stupid and fools and dumb, it might not be, you might, you might be getting persecuted for the right reason. You might have heard someone with the bullhorn preaching that, you know, who God hates. Let's use Jesus' approach. He talks about who Jesus loves, yeah. Right? And then if you're persecuted for loving people, then you're, this is what applies to you. Then Jesus is talking to you. If you're persecuted for doing the right thing, listen to Jesus' word. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. This beatitude has two additional verses. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted the same way. Here's what you need to know. God knows if you're persecuted, right? That's the first thing I just want you to recognize. God knows if you're persecuted. No one likes to be mocked or lied about or have vicious rumors spread about them. Report a coworker from internal theft at work. Guess what you're called? The snitch, right? Get the authorities involved when you hear domestic abuse happening next door. And what do you call it? The snoopy neighbor, right? Give to someone money who doesn't actually need money, but using you for your money. You give them a gift, and you become the sucker. And then other people come and ask you for money, right? Right, right? You can be persecuted for doing the right things. And Jesus knows what you're doing, and he knows your heart, and he knows what it's like to be persecuted. Hebrews 2.18 says, He himself knew what it was like to be tested and trialed in all these ways so that he can understand where we're at. And that last line says, Remember the ancient prophets who were persecuted this way. You see, when you're persecuted, we start wondering, is it worth it? Right? Because doing the right thing is, isn't easy. We can't pretend it is. We start wondering, is it worth it? Should I get involved? Should I do the right thing here? It's easy on Sunday morning to say, yes, we should. But find yourself tomorrow morning wondering if you should do the right thing. That's where some tension comes in. It's really difficult to make the decision to do the right thing because we get persecution. And what I love the Bible so honest about it, look at the prophets that Jesus talked about. Look at Elijah, Jeremiah, Daniel, read their stories. They were persecuted for doing right. But I also think of John the Baptist, and I like how his story unfolds here. If you're not familiar with the Bible, if you're not sure who John the Baptist is, he was Jesus' cousin who was the forerunner for Jesus. He prepared the way. You read the, you read the Christmas story of Jesus coming, you'll see that John the Baptist came first. And you'll see that he prepared the way. He actually told his disciples, hey, I'm not the way. Jesus is the way. Follow him. He wasn't jealous. He wanted to see Jesus lifted up. So he had his heart right. Jesus said this about John the Baptist. It's quite a statement. He says, I tell you the truth. Of all who ever lived, none is greater than John the Baptist. Wow. What a story, right? That's what he said about John the Baptist. But do you know John the Baptist found himself in prison for doing the right thing? If you know a story, he was in prison. You can read about it in Matthew chapter 11. He had took on a, a leader during that time because he was having a bad relationship. And when he confronted him, it wasn't celebrated. He didn't repent. Herod found himself offended. And so he sent John away. And so John's in prison suffering for doing right. And he's like, I don't know if this makes any sense. So look at the question he sent his followers to ask. John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard about all the things the Messiah was doing. So he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the Messiah? We've been expecting, or should we keep looking for someone else? You ever had that feeling? You did the right thing. You wondered why you're like, Jesus, did I mess up? This is really hard right now, God. Did I do the right thing? Or did I just make a mistake? Because it's hard right now. It's harder than it was. If you felt that way, well, John the Baptist did too. And listen to what Jesus said back. Jesus let him have it. He says, go back and tell John, tell him what you've heard and seen. 
the blind see, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. And he added, God blesses those who do not fall away because of me. He didn't let John have it. He encouraged him. In fact, he said no one greater than John has ever lived after this response. When you're having a hard time and you're like, God, is this right? Am I doing the right thing? He's not mad at you. He's thankful you come to him. You're saying, I need more information. I need your spirit to live this out. That's not a bad thing. It's good to go to Jesus. Because here's the deal. When we're persecuted, we must stay faithful. Jesus says we're going to be persecuted. So be like John and be willing to step into that statement and say, God, this isn't going like I thought it was. Help me be faithful. And it'll help you to be faithful. Because circumstances can sometimes get us to question things. But don't let hard times cause you to question doing the right thing. Do the right thing. What kind of blessing is this? Remember Jesus' attitude. He says, God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you're my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad. A great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted this way. And here's what he says. You're blessed now with the knowledge that you're doing the right thing. You might not have a reward out there, but there's a statement that I love. There's no pillow softer than the pledge of a good conscience, right? You ever put your head down and you just feel like life's hard, but I did the right thing today. That's a peace that you can have that transcends everything. You can just be like, okay, Jesus, this is crazy out here. And I put my head down on this pillow and I'm like, but it's right here. That way you find yourself in prison or you find yourself alone, or you find yourself isolated, and you just find this peace that transcends all understanding because he's with you. But I need you to understand this too. He says we have a reward in heaven too, and sometimes we just make too little of this, right? Oh, it's heaven. Okay, whatever. Life's hard today. (laughs) It's just what it is today, right? I admit it takes faith to know that God's with you and making everything right and in control, right? It's hard to see that God is doing something bigger. Because do you remember how John's story ends? He was beheaded. Like, he hears that message like, hey, don't lose heart. God blesses those who do not fall away because of me. And you're going to die soon. You're going to be beheaded. You're like, where's the blessing in that? What about goody, goody two shoes? Like, I'm supposed to get married to somebody rich before I die because I did the right thing. I don't know if you saw this uh, rope on the way in, and if you drive a vehicle that's real tall and you broke the rope down, sorry. (laughs) So this is stretched everywhere. This is a this is a good illustration here. I hope you enjoy it. This is uh, your life here, and this is eternity. It goes all the way into the woods. Like you should be like really like uh, Pat. We did a good job putting the rope there. I don't want to disappoint you. There's an ending. But as you're driving away, I just need you to pretend it keeps going all the way through the woods. We don't grasp eternity really well, right? Because here's where we live. Let's be generous. This is 100 years. And we're like, oh, my gosh. I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it to the day. Okay. You ever had a kid lose a sports game and said life's over? Yeah, exactly. You ever had somebody break up with your like game over, life's done. And you're like, dude, you're 12. (laughs) Perspective helps when we're having a hard time. And I get it. I'm not minimizing this life. Sometimes this life right here, eight seconds is a long time if you're riding a bull. All the bull riders in the crowd. Oh, nobody. But Eight seconds can be a long time, right? A week can be a hard time. A month can be a hard time. We, Jesus does not minimize pain, and I'm not trying to either, but I do say a perspective is helpful. Look at Jesus' words. Or actually, this is Paul's words who echoes what Jesus says in 1 Timothy. He says, these words to Timothy, Paul knew his time was running short. He had been faithful to the gospel. He had been preaching the message, and he has this protege. He wants to, Timothy to follow in his footsteps, and he says these words. As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering. My life's about done. I poured out the glass. I got about this much left. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race, and I have remained faithful. Next slide. 
And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, the God who judges right things, the God who makes sure that the right things I did are accounted for, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. Friends, this is the good life message we've been talking about. If you're like, that's not my life, I'm a mess up. Remember the first part, blessed are the poor in spirit. If you feel like you don't measure up, you're at the right spot. You're like, God, I want this eternity with you, but I can't get there on my own. I need you. And so we pause and we're like, God, I'm poor. I gave you my life and I need you as my savior, right? And then we look on the other side that when we make that decision and people aren't celebrating us and cheering us on and thanking us for doing the right thing, we're like, I got a blessing. I got a blessing coming. Life's hard, but I'm doing the right thing and it'll be made right in the end. So folks, wherever you find yourself, know that God sees you. He wants to give you strength and he wants to walk with you. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word and I thank you for your honesty in it. God, it's good to be reminded that we might not be cheered on for doing the right thing. Because God, the right thing is the right thing for the right thing's sake. We want to honor you and we know that it actually leads to the better good. Retaliation feels good, but only for a moment. So God, help us to do the right thing. Empower us with your spirit to do the right thing. And help us to envision a future with you where we're rewarded for doing the right thing because we love you. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that word today. I'm going to turn your attention as we prepare for communion today to Matthew chapter number 26. Matthew chapter number 26. I'm going to start reading at verse number 26. The Bible says, as they were eating, Jesus, Jesus took some bread and blessed it, and then he broke it into pieces. And gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this and eat it, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine, and he gave thanks to God for it. He gave thanks, and he said, Each of you will drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It's poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. When we talk about communion, Communion is a commitment. It's something that we do to remember and we reflect on the suffering and all that Christ went through in order to make a way for us to be able to spend eternity with him. And now it's a time for the commitment of reflecting on your life to determine how closely you're walking with the Lord. You're growing, you're making progress, you're committing yourself to him. Today, as I stand here, I see Sister Ivanel Garner with us. That's a commitment. Her husband passed, and homegoing service would be on Saturday, but yet she finds herself right here in the house of God. It's a commitment. And what I want you to think about today is your commitment to Christ. How committed are you? So our choir is going to come, and they're going to give us a selection. And then we'll take communion together.
invite everybody to the communion table. We ask that you take your elements. First take and open up your wafer that represents Christ's body. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you today for the opportunity to be able to take communion. Lord, we take this wafer that's representative of your body that was broken for us and we all eat it together. And Lord, we take this juice that's representative of your blood that was shed on Calvary's cross for the remission of our sins, and we all drink it together. Amen. To God be the glory. Amen. This morning, if you have a prayer request, we ask that you would meet us here on this side of the sanctuary at our banner. If you're coming for salvation, if you're coming for prayer, for strength, for comfort, we ask that you would meet us here. Whatever it is that you need, we're here, we're available, we're ready to pray with you. Amen. We want to thank you for being a part of our service today. God bless you. And always remember that Jesus never fails. Amen. You are dismissed today. You are dismissed.